G'day, and welcome to the AOS Coach sneak peek into the 2022 Sons of Behemoth Battle Tome. Now in this video, I am going to focus on everything you need to know about Sons, including the Allegiance abilities, your War Scroll changes, enhancements, all the good stuff as well as the points. Now Games Workshop did send me this book in advance, however they're not going to see the video before it goes live. As always, you'll also find this book is full of art and narrative gems and Path to Glory, as well as that unique code for you to access the rules in the AOS app. Let's start with the Sun's Allegiance abilities. Sons have kept their Mightier Makes Rightier ability that allows them to count as more models while contesting objectives, but there are a couple of changes. Man Crusher Gargans are going to count as 10 models each on the objective, although there is a sub-faction that allows you to increase that number. Where the changes happened is in the Mega Gargant variant, so your Kraken Eater, your War Stomper, and your Gatebreaker. The Mega Gargant variants no longer count as a flat number when it comes to contesting objectives. You may recall in the old book, regardless if I was at full health, half health, or almost dead, the number I was contesting against was always the same number. The way it works now is that the number you count as when you're sitting on an objective will be determined by your damage table, so it will degrade over time. There was nothing worse for your opponent when it came to a Mega Gargant sitting on one health left, still counting as 20 on an objective. So this is probably no different if you've been playing Kragnos in the past. Every Sun's army must belong to one of the sub-faction tribes, and you will notice that you've not only retained the Taker, Breaker, and Stomper tribes from the old book, but you've also gained a new one called the Smasher tribe. Now, your tribe is determined by your general, so if you want to take the Taker tribe, for example, you'll need to take a Kraken Eater as the general. The same is true for the other tribes, so if you want the Breaker tribe, you must have a Gatebreaker as your general, the new Beast Smasher must be the general for the Smasher tribe, and the Stomper tribe is tied to a War Stomper general. Wrath of Titans is a new allegiance ability that gives us access to alternative monstrous rampages, in addition to the universal ones like Raw, Stomp, Titanic Duel, and Smash to Rubble. These monstrous rampages are only available to your Mega Gargans. Beast Grapple allows you to pick one enemy monster within three inches of this unit and roll a dice. On a 3+, plus, until the end of that combat phase, the Strike Last effect applies to both the monster and the unit that's carrying out the monstrous rampage. Earthshaking Roar lets you pick one enemy unit with a wounds characteristic of 1 or 2 that's within 3 inches of this unit and roll 2d6. If the roll is higher than the unit's bravery characteristic, for each point that the roll exceeds the bravery characteristic, one model in that unit flees. That unit's commanding player gets to decide which of the models flee, and the Monstrous Rampage is not considered a Battleshock test. Colossal Slam lets you pick one enemy monster that's not a part of a unit that consists of two or more models, and that's within half an inch of the unit. Now you get to roll a dice. On a 3+, plus, you can remove that monster from the battlefield and set it up again wholly within open ground within half an inch of that unit, so obviously not on top of other models. That monster suffers D3 mortal wounds. In addition, subtract one from the hit rolls for attacks made by the unit carrying out the monstrous rampage, so you, until the end of the combat phase. As someone who likes to run three to four Mega Gargans, I love having access to a few extra options because in some matchups, I find some of the universal rampages just aren't valuable. OG Suns players will notice that the Man Crusher's ability to throw rocks is no longer an ability, which is a great news, and it's just a regular shooting attack now. The way we access command traits and artifacts has changed a little bit. In the new book, we have access to a universal set of Suns um, command traits and artifacts that's available to all of the tribes, and then depending on which tribe you do take, you do unlock a few extra. There are three Universal Sun's Commands traits to choose from. You have Monstrously Tough that gives the General a Wounds characteristic of 40 instead of 35. Furious Temper once per battle when this General is picked to fight, you can say that it's overcome with Rage. If you do so, until the end of that phase, use the top row of this General's damage table, regardless of how many wounds that it suffered. Finally, you've got Rabble Rouser, and you get to add one to the charge rolls for friendly Sons of Behemoth units that are wholly within 18 inches of that general. Of the three universal traits, I would say the Monstrously Tough is still my favourite. 
I want to keep my general alive as long as possible and giving it a couple of extra wounds will allow me to heal, control objectives and just smash. There are four universal artifacts to choose from. Extra callous feet is for models that are armed with the almighty stomp only so I think that's all of your mega gargants except the war stomper. Now the bearer's almighty stomp will have an attack characteristic of 3 instead of 2. Uh, it'll gain a rend of 3 instead of rend minus 2. And the damage characteristic is a flat 3 instead of d3. Glowy shield of protection when this unit is targeted by an attack. If the weapon's characteristic for that attack has rend minus 1, you change the rend to rend nothing. Now it doesn't reduce the rend, so it doesn't make rend 2 down to rend 1. It just makes rend 1 into rend nothing. In addition, if the unmodified save roll for that attack is made by a melee weapon and it targets the bearer and you roll a flat 6, the attacking unit's going to suffer one mortal wound after all of the attacks have been resolved. Scavengers wake once per battle at the start of the combat phase. You can pick one enemy unit within 3 inches of the bearer and roll a number of dice equal to the number of models in that unit to a maximum of 10. For each 4 plus, that enemy is going to suffer one mortal wound. And finally, the Amberbone Totem, the bearer can attempt to make a charge even if it ran in the same turn. Now, Glowy Shield of Protection and Amberbone are probably my two favorites from this list. The Amberbone giving it to a Gatebreaker then, using a command point to run six and then charge is a terrifying proposition. While the Glowy Shield goes back to what I was saying earlier about wanting to keep my Megas around for as long as possible. So by reducing the impacts of Rend minus one, plus a few cheeky mortal wounds with a save of six, so what are the tribe specific command traits and artifacts? Looking at the Taker tribe and that requires us to have a Kraken Eater General. You get two extra battle traits. Get rid of them for the purpose of contesting objectives. Each friendly man crusher model is going to count as 15 instead of 10. And in addition, you get to add five to the Mightier Makes Rightier value for your Kraken Eaters that are contesting the objective. So if you bring in a War Stomper or a Gatebreaker or a Beast Smasher, it doesn't change that number purely for Kraken Eaters. The second one is I want that for me collection. Now you can use this command ability at the start of the combat phase. The command can only be issued by your general and the unit that receives the command must be a friendly man crusher unit. Until the end of that phase, you get to add one to the damage characteristic for attacks made by melee weapons that target the enemy unit if they have a artifact of power or they are a unique model. You get two additional command traits. With Very Inquisitive, if you give an artifact of power to this general, you can pick an extra artifact of power and give it to them as well. So essentially, you get to give two artifacts of power to your general, and both artifacts must be different, so you can't stack with double arcane tome, for example. The other is extremely intimidating, and enemy units within six inches of this general cannot receive the inspiring presence or rally commands. On top of that, you've got two extra artifacts. You've got the Walloping Tentacles, which is for Kraken Eaters only. Now, at the start of the combat phase, you can pick one enemy hero within three inches of the bearer and roll a dice. On a four plus, that hero suffers D3 mortal wounds, and the strike last effect applies to that hero until the end of the phase. You've also got the Glowy Lantern, which is also Kraken Eater only. In your hero phase, the bearer can attempt to cast one spell that summons an endless spell in the same manner as a wizard. When they do so, the range of that spell is doubled. I've always enjoyed the Taker tribe, and it was the tribe that I very first started with on my son's journey, but I found that counting as even more models on the objective was usually excessive and mostly unuseful, but now that the Mega Gargans have a degrading profile, it actually might be worth reconsidering. The command ability seems situational at best. My favorite command trait of the two probably would be extremely intimidating to help shut down those inspiring presence and rallies within six. My favorite artifact would be the Walloping Tentacle and I would love to say the Glowy Lantern, but at the moment I'd just rather take the Arcane Tome and get access to like Mystic Shields, but maybe I can take Arcane Tome as well as Glowy Lantern if I want to cast both an Endless Spell and Mystic Shield. Next up is our Breaker Tribe, and that requires us to have a Gate Breaker General. Breaker Tribe gets access to three battle traits. 
Breaking down the house allows you to add one to the damage inflicted by each successful attack made by a Man Crusher Gargant unit that is targeting an enemy unit that's a part of either a garrison or wholly within a terrain feature. Ramming Speed is a command ability that you can issue at the start of the charge phase. The command can only be issued by your general and the unit that receives the command must be a friendly Man Crusher unit. Until the end of that phase, you can attempt to make a charge with that unit that received the command if it's within 18 inches of an enemy instead of 12, and in addition you get to roll 3d6 instead of 2d6 when making a charge for that unit until the end of that phase. Finally is Fierce Loathing, and when you pick a Breaker Tribe, you get to pick one of these Fierce Loathings and record it to your army. Now, everyone that is a Gate Breaker or a Man Crusher will receive the following benefit depending on which one you pick. Bossy Boots and Clever Clogs will add one to the hit rolls for attacks made by this unit that targets an enemy hero or a wizard. Idiots with Flags will add one to hit rolls that target an enemy totem unit or a unit that has a command model. Or Wannabes will add one to hit rolls for attacks that target an enemy war machine or monster. You have two extra command traits. Extremely Bitter allows you to pick a second Fierce Loathing and apply it to your general only. Or you've got Seize Red, and in the combat phase, if the general is within three inches of a defensible terrain feature, or an enemy that is wholly within a terrain feature, you can use the top row of the general's damage table, regardless of how many wounds it suffered. You've also got two additional artifacts of power. The Great Wrecker is for Gatebreakers only, and if the unmodified hit roll for the attack made by the Flail is a 6, the attack causes D3 mortal wounds in addition to any other damage that it inflicts. The other artifact is the King Slaughter Call, and again, that's also for only Gatebreakers. You get to add one to wound rolls for attacks made by the bearer that targets an enemy hero. Idiots with Flags or Bossy Boots and Clever Clogs are the two fierce loathings that I bounce around, depending on what I expect to see, either if I'm going to be fighting a lot of tanky heroes or if I'm looking to handle more units. At the moment, I'd pick Idiots with Flags because I still have the Titanic Jewel for Monster Heroes and obviously all that attack unless I'm roared. Extremely Bitter is my favorite command trait because we just don't see enough defensible terrain at events to make this worthwhile, and cover is situational. And the King's Claw would probably be my favorite of the artifacts because you're going to improve that damage consistency against heroes. I love this sub-faction because of ramming speed, the fierce loathings, and a lot of the things that are in this list really play to the strengths of Suns. Stomper Tribe is for your War Stomper General, and it got a massive overhaul which was needed. The old rules, in my opinion, were too restrictive, and I could never justify using them. There are three new battle traits, the first one being Big Shouts. Big Shouts is after the General issues a command to a friendly Man Crusher's unit. Until the end of that phase, they can issue the same command to any other friendly Man Crusher's unit without spending further command points. Grab Those Rocks and Chuck em is a command ability that you can use at the start of your shooting phase. Now that unit that receives the command must be a friendly Man Crusher's unit. And until the end of that phase, you can add one to the attack characteristics for the throwing rocks. Getting Stuck In is the third battle trait that allows you to add one to the damage inflicted by each successful attack made by a friendly Man Crusher unit that is targeting a unit that has 10 or 19 models, and you get to add two to the damage if you are targeting a unit with 20 or more models. The two extra command traits you have Inscapable Grip. When you use the General's Hurl Body ability, you can re-roll both of the dice, which will all make better sense when we look at the War Scroll. And then eager for the fight, and you can attempt to make a charge with the general if it's within 18 inches of an enemy instead of 12. In addition, you can roll 3d6 instead of 2d6 when making that charge roll for the general. And the two extra artifacts, you have Clubber the First Oak is for War Stompers only. In your hero phase, you can heal one wound allocated to the bearer. In addition, while the bearer has 25 or more wounds allocated to them, they have a 5-up ward. Mantle of the Destroyer is the other War Stomper only artifact, and that allows you to have friendly Sons of Behemoth units that are within 12 inches of the bearer, give them a bravery characteristic of 10. Stomper Tribe has always felt like it's been built around heavy Man Crusher armies, and it's definitely better than it used to be. I'm more inclined to run Stomper if we moved into an infantry style horde meta, where we see lots of units of 10 or more models. My favorite command trait would be eager for the fight to charge from 18 and have a 3d6 charge 
which makes you a lot earlier of a threat to your opponent, while the Club of the First Oak healing one wound a turn, giving me a 5 up ward while I'm on 25 wounds allocated, might be one of my favourites. The final and newest tribe is the Smasher tribe, and that requires you to have the Beast Smasher as your general. This was not in the old book. The Smasher tribe has two battle traits. Bone Crushing Strikes is the first one, and when a friendly Man Crusher Gargant unit fights, if it's within three inches of an enemy monster, you can say that it unleashes a Bone Crushing Strike. If you do so until the end of that phase, the attack characteristic of the Massive Club is a 1, and it cannot be modified. The damage characteristic is a 4d6, and all of the attacks made by the Massive Club must target an enemy monster. The other one is Don't Let a Few Cuts Stop You, and you can use this command ability at the start of the combat phase. The command can only be issued by the general, and it must be received by a friendly Man Crusher Gargant unit. Until the end of that phase, use the top row of the monster's damage table, and in addition, until the end of that phase, each time a model is slain, uh, it allows you to fight before you die. There are two command traits, the first one being Seize Green. Once per battle at the start of the phase, you can say that this general is Gorkamorka made manifest, and if you do so, this general has a ward of 4 plus against mortal wounds until the end of that phase. The other one is Marrow Drinker, and each time an enemy monster is slain by this general, you get to roll a number of dice equal to the monster's wound characteristic. On a 5 plus, you can heal one wound allocated to the general. There are two artifacts of power, both for Beast Smashers only. With the Shatterer, if the unmodified wound roll for the attack made by the club's Men Hears Club targets an enemy hero, monster, or war machine, and it's a 6, that unit's armor has been shattered. If the unit's armor is shattered until the end of the battle, you can ignore positive modifiers to save rolls that target that unit. The other one is the Mantle of the Tusks and Horns, again Beast Smasher only, and once per battle at the start of the combat phase, you can say that the bearer is going to channel the war. If you do so, add 1 to hit rolls for attacks made by melee weapons for friendly Sons of Behemoth units until the end of that phase. I really like the Smasher Tribe and I'm excited to give it actually a go, but I'm a bit of a risk adverse person and I'm looking at this going high risk, high rewards, and there are some abilities that are making me nervous. Sure, I have the potential of doing 4d6 damage, but that attack sequence can easily fluff because you reduce the massive club attack down to 1. And if it goes through, it does have the potential to spike to 24 damage, but it also has the ability to go to 4. Now looking at Maths Hammer, the average dice on 4d6 is 14, so if you want to take the risk, power to you. My favorite command trait would probably be Marrow Drinker to heal up wounds after it kills a monster, which is really what I want the Beast Smasher to do anyway. While the Shatterer's artifact can cut through heroes that save stack using Mystic Shield or that defense finest hour. Suns did gain a bunch of Grand Strategies, Battle Tactics, and War Scroll Battalions. There are four Grand Strategies to choose from. Brod's Revenge can only be picked if your army includes King Brod. And when the battle ends, you complete the Grand Strategy if King Brod has not been slain, and if you've used all three effects of the Power of Behemoth Prayers at least once in the battle. This will make more sense when we look at the War Scroll. Make the Lands Tremble is completed if any friendly units made a run or a charge move in every battle round. It doesn't have to be the same unit that does it, it just has to happen at least once in every turn. On the Warpath is completed if every friendly unit on the battlefield is within enemy territory. And finally, you have Sholm, who's boss. At the start of the battle, the enemy unit with the highest wound characteristic is marked as the big one. And if there are multiple enemy units that are tied with the highest wounds characteristic, I get to pick who's the big one. When the battle ends, I complete this grand strategy if the big one has been slayed and my general is not slain. I'm planning on running Brod's Revenge, and I'm curious to see if I can keep him around on the table for the full game. But alternatively, I'm looking at Make the Lands Tremble or On the Warpath. There are six battle tactics. That's mine, allows you to pick one objective on the battlefield that's not within your territory. And you complete the tactic if the objective is kicked away and wholly within your territory at the end of the turn. That's really for your Kraken Eater. Wrecking Crew, you complete if an enemy faction terrain is destroyed during this turn. Man Skittles is completed if a friendly War Stomper unit has used its Hurl Bodies ability. 
an enemy model is slain by the first part of the ability and an enemy battle line unit is picked for the second ability and it suffered some mortal wounds. Fury of Titans is completed if you carry out the Beast Grapple, the Earthshaker Roar, and the Colossal Slam Monstrous Rampages this turn. Splat lets you pick one enemy hero and is completed if that enemy hero is slain by models caused by throwing rocks, hurled debris, or the hurled boulder. So that's basically all of your shooting attacks in this turn. Colossal Violence lets you pick one friendly Mega Gargan. It's going to require you to do the Titanic Jewel Monstrous Rampage by this unit, and the enemy monster that you target has to be slain by the attacks made by this unit in this turn. Finally, there are two core battalions for you to use at your next tournament. You've got the Foot Sloggers that requires you to have two Man Crusher units, as well as you've got the optional Mega Gargan and an optional Man Crusher. What the benefit is, is you can either have a one drop unified or you can get swift, which is once per turn, get that free all out attack or forward to victory. The other battalion is bosses of the stomp that requires you to have at least two mega gargans with an optional two extra mega gargans. The benefit is either unified, so being one drop, or you can take magnificent to get the extra enhancement. What was a very common practice if you were running four Mega Gargans is you could definitely run double bosses of the Stomp to go to two drop or to get even more artifacts. Let's dig into the War Scrolls a little bit deeper, starting off with King Brod, who has a movement starting at 10, but that is tied in, into the damage profile, has a base save of four, bravery of nine, and 40 wounds. He has three attack profiles, and two of the three are relatively consistent across the Mega Gargans. All three have range profile of three. Uh, the Obelisk starts at four attacks, but does degrade on the damage profile. Hitting on threes, wounding on threes, rend two for five damage. The Almighty Stomp has two attacks, hitting on threes, wounding on threes, rend two for D3. And then the Death Grip uh, is one attack, hitting on threes, wounding on twos, rend two for D6. You'll see that the, the damage profile does go from 0 to 18, 19 to 26, 27 to 35, and 35 plus. And then on the far left, you'll notice where the Mightier Mate Rydia profile does start to degrade. So your Mega Gargan with King Broad starts at 25, degrades to 20, 18, and 15, depending on where he is on the damaged profile. There are a bunch of abilities on King Broad that is also shared across all of the Mega Gargans. That includes Crushing Charge, Death Grip, Long Shank, Sons of Behemoth, Terra, and Timber. Crushing Charge, after this unit makes a charge move, you get to roll the dice for each enemy unit within one inch of this unit. On a 2+, it suffers D3 mortal wounds if it was a monster, or D6 if it was not a monster. Death Grip has changed. Now, when determining the damage inflicted by the Death Grip, if it's targeting a monster, you get to roll two dice and pick the result that you prefer. Almighty Stomp is another one of these rules that is consistent across uh, most of your Megas, and that is going to add one to the hit rolls for attacks made by the Almighty Stomp if it targets an enemy wound characteristic of three or less. With long shanks, when this unit makes a normal move, run, or retreat, it can pass across other models that are not a monster, uh, or as a part of a terrain feature that is less than 4 inches. So it essentially can fly if it makes a normal move, run, or retreat, not a charge, um, as long as it's not keyworded monster. Sons of Behemoth cannot be auto-slain, things like uh, Hand of Dust or Slayer of Kings. If you would normally auto-slay, uh, you just do d6 mortal wounds instead. Terra has changed for the better. It used to cause minus one to your bravery. Now enemy units cannot receive Inspiring Presence Command while they're within three inches of a Mega. The other rule that's consistent across all the Megas is Timber. And if this model is slain, before we remove the Mega from the table, we roll off. Uh, the player who wins the roll off gets to pick a point on the battlefield within five inches of the slain Mega. Now, each unit that's within three inches of that point that we pick, that's not a Mega, is going to suffer D3 mortal wounds. So your Mega falling over can hurt your Man Crushers, but your Mega falling around a Mega won't hurt a Mega. A couple of unique rules for King Brod is that he is a War Master, so he can be included in a Sun's army and is treated as a General, even if he's not the General. Two other rules that are unique to King Brod. First one is Creepers. In each charge phase, the first time an enemy monster within three inches of this unit is picked to carry out a monstrous rampage, you get to roll a dice. 
If the roll is equal or greater than the creeper's value roll on the damage table, that monster cannot carry out that monstrous rampage. And finally, the rule that I'm most excited about because we heard he was a priest, but how does it actually work? Well, it's here in the Power of Behemoth. Now, Power of Behemoth is a prayer that has an answer value of three. You get to add one to the chanting roll if an enemy monster has been slain by King Brod in this battle. If answered, you get to pick one of the following effects, but you can't choose the same effect more than once per battle. Shatter the Mountains adds plus two to the movement characteristic of Friendly Sun's units until the end of the turn. Might of the Earth lets you heal D3 wounds allocated to each Friendly Sun's unit. Pummel All to Dust improves the Ren characteristic for the following melee weapons used by Friendly Sons of Behemoth units by one until the end of the turn. Those weapons are the Obelisk of Torocrania, the Meehan Club, the Shipwrecker War Club, the Titanic Boulder Club, the Fort Crusher Flail, and the Massive Club. And when it comes to the keywords, you've got Destruction, Sons of Behemoth, Mega Gargant, Hero, Monster, Priest, King Broad. Next up is the Beast Smasher Mega Gargant, which is a new kit to our range. You'll notice the damage profile has changed as well. You have four tiers, 0 to 15, 16 to 22, 23 to 29, and 30 plus. And to the right, you'll see Mightier Makes Rydia starting off at 20, degrading down to 18, 15, and 12 when it's on its final bracket. It too has the Almighty Stomp and the Death Grip, which is consistent to what we saw and we will see continuing into the other Megas. But the club is unique to the Beast Smasher with a 3-inch range, 3 attacks, hitting on 3s, wounding on 2s, uh, a rend of Asterix, so starting at 3, uh, for a damage of flat 5. The Beast Smasher Mega Gargant does have a bravery that's better than the other Megas. So King Broad was at 9, the other Megas are at 7, the Beast Smasher is at 8. A couple of the unique abilities on the Beast Smasher. First is the Beast Breaking Strike. Now when this unit fights, if it's within 3 inches of an enemy monster, you can say that it's unleashing a Beast Breaking Strike. If you do so, until the end of that phase, the attacking characteristic of the Men Here Club is a 1, and it cannot be modified. The damage characteristic of 5d6, and all of the attacks made by the club must target that enemy monster. Now you might remember a very similar rule in the Smasher Tribe that you can give to your Man Crushers, except it was 4d6, not 5d6. The other unique ability is the Behemoth Brawler, and at the end of the charge phase, if this unit is within 3 inches of an enemy monster, you can carry out 2 monstrous rampages instead of 1. If you do so, each monstrous rampage carried out with this unit must target a different enemy monster. Next up is the Kraken Eater, and because we've already talked about some of these rules, I'll just call out some of those key changes. The move is down to 10, and you'll see all of the Mega Gargants now move as 10. So the Kraken Eater used to be 11, the um, Gatebreaker used to be a 12, all of your Megas now move at 10. Mightier Makes Rydia, as we've already talked about, is a degrading profile. Again, you can see it's consistent, 20, 18, 15, 12. All of your melee attacks are now range 3. It used to be like range 2 and range 3 all scattered around. It's now just consistent range 3. The Shipwrecker War Club has gone from 8 attacks for 2 damage to 4 attacks for 4 damage. So you've got less dice rolls, but they do more damage when they go through. The Almighty Stomp ability has changed and it's no longer giving you a reroll 1s to your Almighty Stomp attack profile that's not targeting a monster. Now it's plus 1 to hit if you are targeting a unit that has a wounds characteristic of 3 or less. The Death Grip no longer gives you a reroll 1s to hit against monsters. Now it does let you roll 2 dice when determining the Death Grip damage and choosing which one is better of D6 damage. The Death Grip has also gone down to Ren 2 that used to be Ren 3. Long Shanks has had a minor language change and you just can't move over monsters now. That was no longer a restriction. And finally, just to reinforce, Terra no longer gives you a bravery debuff. Instead, it is shutting down Inspiring Presence while you're within 3 inches of the Mega. Next up is your War Stomper Mega Gargant, which is another existing unit that I'll call out the changes for. Uh, it has a lot of similarities, the same move, save, bravery, wounds. The Titanic Boulder Club jump up and down profile seem the same. Some loophole jank has been closed off with hurled bodies. Now it happens at pile-in rather than an optional once per phase ability. 
Almighty Jump has a similar change to Almighty Stomp. You're now getting plus one to hit against enemies that have a wound characteristic of three or less. It too had the same changes for your, for your Death Grip, your Long Shanks, your Terra. The last of your Mega Gargans, and still my favorite, is the Gatebreaker. A lot of similarity, again, from the old profile. It too had a reduced movement down to 10. It used to be 12, but that's consistent across all of the Mega Gargans now. They're all base move of 10, and it does degrade against the damage profile. All of your melee attacks are now range 3. The Fort Crusher Flail has been rewritten. It used to have 10 attacks that used to do damage 3. Now it has 6 attacks that does damage 4. The hit, the wound, the rend all remains unchanged. It too has the same Almighty Stomp, Death Grip, Long Shanks, and Terror that I've already spoken about. Next up, we have the two variants of the Man Crushers that can be purchased either as a single or a unit of three called the Man Crusher Mob. Now, both the Man Crusher and Man Crusher Mob share the same base profile with the move, the save, the bravery, and the wounds. It's still the same missile weapon profile, but it's no longer triggered off your general, which was an ability in the old book that is no longer in the new book, which is great news. There is still a lot of commonality when it comes to the old war scroll. It does mortal wounds on the charge through stomping charge. You can still remove some models through stuffing of the bag when you pile in, as well as the model still does timber. So when it dies, it will fall over and do some damage. So what are the changes and what has it gained? Keep Up's range has been extended. It used to be 12. It's now up to 15. So what Keep Up allows your Man Crushers to do, both the Man Crusher and the Man Crusher mob, is it can run and charge so long as it is within 15 inches of a Mega. And remember, we do have some of the tribes that do allow you to do like a 3d6 charge as well. Or you could obviously combine Kragnos. Now, the Man Crusher mob has gained a Bull Stomper champion, and now it can issue commands to itself. In addition, the Bull Stomper gets plus one attack on its massive club. The other rule that's been gained by the Man Crusher mob is Ooze Under Me Heal. If you carry out the Stomp Monstrous Rampage with the Bull Stomper and you roll the 2+, plus, for every other Man Crusher model in the unit, you get to add one to the number of mortal wounds caused. Finally, we have our Mercenary Mega Gargants, which will allow non-Suns armies to bring in a Mega Gargant. Perhaps your faction needs something that can smash, maybe you need a big monster, maybe you need a unit with lots of wounds. Now, all of the Mega Gargants are locked to different Grand Alliances, and if you do so, no other allied unit can be included in your army. It will allow you to include this ally, even though it will exceed your points limit for allied units. Otto Godswallower is a Beast Smasher mercenary available to destruction armies that aren't Suns, and the benefit that you get is you get to add one to hit rolls for attacks made by this unit that target an enemy monster. Bundo Whalebiter is a Kraken Eater mercenary that's available to order and destruction armies that are not Suns. And its special mercenary rule is Dead Cunning for a Gargan. Now at the start of the combat phase, you can say that this unit will be uncannily cunning. If you do so, the strike last effect applies to this unit until the end of the phase, but you get to add one to the hit rolls and wound rolls for attacks made by this unit until the end of the phase. One-Eyed Gunnock is a War Stomper mercenary that's available to Chaos and Destruction armies that aren't Suns. Its mercenary ability is Shake the Earth. Subtract one from hit rolls for attacks made by enemy units within six inches of this unit if it's made its jump up and down attack earlier in the same phase. Finally, you have Big Grog Fork Kicker, which is a Gatebreaker Mercenary available to death and destruction armies that are not Suns. Its mercenary ability is Grievous Halitosis. At the end of the combat phase, you can pick one enemy unit within three inches of this unit and roll a number of dice equal to the number of models in this unit that are within three inches of this unit. For each six, it will suffer one mortal wound. We have seen some points adjustments in Suns. Our new King Brod is coming in at 580 points, which I found really interesting when it comes to building my lists. The new Beast Smasher is 520 points, which is also the same price as the Gatebreaker, who went down 5 points. There were some much larger changes when it comes to the individual Man Crushers. They've went down 20 points to be 150 points each. And the Man Crusher mob is now 450 points for three Man Crushers, and that does include the unit champion. 
The War Stomper Mega also went down 20 points to be 450, while I didn't notice any change for the Kraken Eater. All of these units will fulfill your battle line, and before you ask, no, Suns didn't get any allies. As always, the true list tech for your next game is not really going to be clear until the FAQ, which will drop about four weeks after this book hits the shelves. I am genuinely excited about playing Suns, and so much so that I am looking to switch my army that I was going to bring to the Las Vegas Open from Stormcast to Suns. What I'm most excited about is the additional unit selections. Things like the Beast Smasher and King Brod will bring some utility to my army, especially King Brod who will bring prayers and extra abilities. There has been some War Scroll changes, which are probably fine. We've lost a little bit of movement. We've lost less attacks, but we do more damage. I'm sure once I get this on the table, I will truly see the output difference between the old book and the new book. The Gatebreaker is probably going to feel a little bit slower going from 12 down to 10 move, and I'm probably going to miss a lot of my rerolls to hit, especially on that single death grip. But getting out extra damage when I hit is probably going to make up for it, but again, let's see what the maths look like on the table. There are plenty of great options for the various tribes, and I'm finding multiple ways to build my list. Fans of this channel will know that I've played Sun since 2nd edition, and I'm bouncing a whole bunch of list ideas at the moment. I haven't really settled on one particular list, which is probably a good thing. It means there's a lot of flexibility when it comes to running Suns. There are a few options that have been lost, but the heart of the army remains the same. It comes as no surprise that we have the degrading Mightier Makes Rightier profile, which makes our army a little bit weaker, but it'll make a better gaming experience, which is only a good thing. I really like the new monstrous rampages and I'm happy to see those white dwarf battalions being added to this book formally. In the very near future I will be having some Suns discussions with top players so we can kind of break this down a little bit further and share some of our intricate thinking especially as we've gotten some practice on the table. But until then I would love to hear from you in the comment section what are you thinking about Suns? What do you think about New King Brod and the Beast Smasher Mega Gargan? What are your thoughts on the Man Crusher Champion? What about things like the reduction in the amount of dice that you roll in attacks, but the higher damage? What about some of the other rules like shutting down Inspiring Presence? Let me know in the comment section. I'd be curious to hear from you how you're thinking about this. I know I'm excited. Where are you at? Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. If you did, I would love it if you pressed like on the video, as well as left me a comment to let me know what your thoughts are. The conversation will continue over on Discord, and the link is down below in the video description. I want to give a massive shout out as well to the AOS Coach Patreons and YouTube members who are going in and the funds are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you're all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a one on a redeploy.